Okay, good morning, everyone. Or good afternoon now. Uh, my name is Dr. Sam Jensen. And so this will be the 112 lab section. So these meetings are supposed to be relatively short. Okay, so I'm not planning on doing too, too long in these videos. The purpose of these videos is, or these phone calls is to go over the lab content. Okay, so normally for an ELI, for an online lab, we did labs on Saturday. And so part of every lab, it was kind of a quick, brief lab lecture about what did you need to know in order to do the experiment? These are still in the same vein as that. There's a little bit more of just, you know, some of them maybe a little bit slightly longer because some, some of the the videos, I, I have extra stuff for some of the simulation labs that we're going to do. Everything is virtual. So most of these labs, there's going to be lab handouts, but also data that goes with it. You are going to do the data calculations and write up lab reports and then submit everything on, on the, the Canvas site. Okay, so let's take a look real quick at the, the Canvas site here. Okay, so obviously if you're you go into to our lab link. So it has the important stuff up front, the lab report format, which we'll cover, cover here in a second, some do's and don'ts. There's the lab PowerPoint, which goes over what I'm gonna do right here real quick. There's also a lab report example, and then the various labs that we're gonna do. So the first one we're gonna do is the hard water lab, then there's a vitamin C titration, kinetics, equilibrium, weak acid titration, electrochem, and so, at the very bottom are the links where you would go to upload your various reports. Okay, so we're gonna do formal lab reports for every lab. Okay, this should be more relatively not uh, new for, for everybody in 112. So let's take a real quick look at the lab reports. Again, none of this should be, none of this should be new. Okay, this is, should not be the first time you've done lab reports, okay. So my real only guidelines are that for some of these is I don't, I really don't want the, the lab pages. Okay, so if there's a PDF of the lab report or a PDF handout, I just don't want my lab PDFs back, okay? So preferably you would write up your lab report and uh, everything would be in a Word document. You would format it and put everything together in one, clean lab, okay? So this is the general lab report format. Every lab that you submit should follow this general format. Name, title, purpose, procedure, the pre-lab questions, data section, and a conclusion, okay? Now, for most of these labs, a lot of this is already kind of put together. So things like the purpose and procedure and pre-lab questions are in most of the lab handouts. Now, if a lab doesn't have pre-lab questions, then obviously you wouldn't put, include that in, in the experiment, okay? Um, most of the lab handouts have data section or data, um, data tables that help you to organize your information. You would wanna recreate the data tables in your report, okay? You fill out your, your report, uh, not pencil in on my, uh, PDF handout, and then writing a conclusion, okay? So every lab we do, there's a purpose to doing, doing every experiment, okay? So the purpose is not always what is stated as the objective in the handout. So some of the, so some of the handouts, um, like they, they talk about the purpose being like to, uh, to, to do titrations or to do redox titrations and things like that. That's that's generally not the purpose of doing the experiment. For most of our experiments, there is there are unknowns. So we want to know what is the identity of the unknown. Okay, so these are examples from 111. Okay, so our purpose for the physical properties lab is to determine a concentration of calcium chloride. So for our first lab today, we're doing a hard water analysis. So we want to know what is the concentration of calcium in our water. Okay. And so the lab we're gonna do today is very similar to a, an experiment that you might do in an environmental lab where we know what's there. We know there's calcium in the water. 
because it is naturally pleasant, like present like many other things like fluoride and things like that in our water. So the question is, what is its concentration? Okay. And then further, what does that mean to me? Like, you know, is it safe to drink? Is it not safe to drink, et cetera? Okay. Um, the procedure sections in most of the handouts are there for you to use. I just don't want my PDF back to me and I don't want C handout. So you just have to write a procedure section or include a procedure section in your report. That procedure section can be bulletized, paraphrased, summarized, plagiarized. You just need to have a procedure section in your report, okay? Now, obviously for today's lab and things like that where we are using a procedure for a lab where we would normally do it in the lab, you just go with the procedure that's written, okay? And pretending as if we were doing it in the lab, okay? And uh, some of these, you're, you're just gonna have the data, okay? But there still is a procedure section for had we done it in the lab, right? Some labs are gonna have pre-lab questions, okay? You don't have to do the questions before the lab. You don't submit the pre-lab questions separately from the lab. They are included with the lab report. Okay, so not all of the labs have pre-lab questions. And one thing that you also, we're also not gonna do is post-lab questions. You don't have to do the post-lab questions. Okay. Right. Again, the data section, most of, most of the labs have a data table for you that you should recreate as you put together your lab report. Again, some of putting our lab reports together is working on our soft skills presentation of material, okay? If you were giving these lab reports to your boss, your boss would not want them written in crayon on a napkin, okay? You would want to put it together in a nice format. Many of us work in a customer-driven area, and so customers are paying for information. And so if your customer is paying you to, for, to do analysis on their water and they wanna know what is the content of the calcium in their water, they want a nice clean report, not something that you hand scratched together. Okay, so again, these are soft skills that are important no matter what class you're doing. It's not, a, not even about chemistry. Okay, it has nothing to do with chemistry, but these are skills that we have to develop along the way is presentation of material. So, even if your material is not great, the least thing you can do is present what you do have in a better way, okay? Is present it in a way that looks good, okay? The conclusion is only a paragraph or so. There should not be anything really long with the conclusions, okay? Uh, these are called different things in different classes. Again, this is a 112 class. So you've already had a 111 chemistry class. Uh, or an intro chemistry class, and these may be called different things, discussion section, summary, or conclusion. They're generally not synonyms, okay? They can have different meaning based on what your professor is looking for, okay? And most professors describe this in a different way, in different ways, or, or what they're looking for in different ways, okay? So what I'm looking for is this. Paragraph format, okay, so I don't want bullets, I don't want uh, fragment sentences or equations put into the conclusion, right? So it should be a paragraph. You should be writing a third person objective, which really just means don't use I, me, we, talking about the experimenter, talking about, you know, Sam doesn't, Sam did this and then Sam did this, right? We don't talk about ourselves in the third person, right? They are complete sentences, English preferably, okay? Um, and our conclusion is focused on what was the purpose of doing the experiment? What was the purpose of the lab, All right? Now, when I teach this, generally, this, these are the four main things that, that, that I put, that I focus on when I teach writing conclusions, okay? What was the purpose of doing the experiment, right? Uh, every purpose, this is kind of like restating the hypothesis kind of thing, okay? A methodology. So this is not a regurgitating the procedure, okay? I don't want a long procedure rewritten, okay? The methodology should be short, all right? 
right? It should be something that you, you summarize, like for example, today's lab, we would be using a titration as our methodology for determining our unknown. Okay, by what, how did we go about determining the purpose of the experiment? And then number three, what was the results? Okay, these are often numerical values. What was the concentration of your unknown? Put that number in there. Those are, those are the important results for the experiment. Okay, and then the last thing is analysis. Some of the labs are not gonna have in-depth analysis. This particular first lab will have some analysis with it. If I tell you that you have five ppm of lead in your water, okay, that may or may not mean anything to you. I mean, unless you automatically assume that any amount of lead in your water is bad, okay? But if you have five ppb of lead in your water, which may be the natural lead content in your area, in your water, okay, it is perfectly fine to drink, okay? You may not have any adverse health effects from drinking water with four ppb of lead, okay? But it was, if it was 40 ppm, maybe then you have something to worry about, okay? So the analysis part is what, is, what does the number mean, right? So I often use the same example, like if we're talking about going to the doctor and getting a blood sample, right? Your, doctors, your doctor would order a blood sample, say you're getting your cholesterol checked, or you're getting a blood panel done because you're, you know, you're having things checked, right? You're, you have, um, you know, you're, you're having back pain or something like that, and they're checking your kidneys. And so the purpose is to, to run a blood panel to determine if there's something, you know, something wrong with your health. The methodology may be different depending on what they're testing. You, you'll get your results. They give you a, 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 if you, you know, you probably have a My Health Portal kind of thing at your doctor and you log in and you see that, you know, your cholesterol was, you know, 112 and then they tell you that the normal range is between these two things and your, you know, your A1C is, you know, this number and it's, these are the normal range. And then you go back to the doctor and they look at all of those numbers together and they make, a diagnosis based on those that information. Maybe those numbers by themselves don't mean anything, okay? But when you put them in context of one another, maybe there maybe it indicates that you have some sort of renal issue, right? Or you have some sort of liver issue that is an underlying health issue, okay? That maybe the number one number is low by itself may not be may not be a big deal, okay? But you need the analysis. What does this mean as a larger picture? with regard to my health, okay? So some labs are gonna have analysis, some labs may not, okay? But whatever the results are, we need to be able to put down actual numbers in the conclusion, okay? So here's an example here, okay? So this conclusion, you'll notice has basically what I'm looking for. There's numbers in there, there's a very brief looking at what the procedure was, but it's not overly intensive, okay? There's data and the results. So this is similar to the lab that you're gonna write today, okay? So if we look at the, the parts here, okay? So the purpose of the experiment, how do we go about testing the the purpose, what did we, how do we go about finding the answer? Okay, there's two parts to your experiment. So part A has an answer and part B has an answer. Both of those results are important towards the final result of the, the, the analysis. And then what does that mean? What is the analysis, what does that number 65 ppm mean? Okay. So these should be relatively short, okay? They should not be very long. Right, a paragraph or, or you know, admit you know is is more than sufficient. You should be able to get it all in within a paragraph. Okay, you should not have to write a whole page of stuff in order to get get through everything. Okay, and so a single lab report is what you will present or submit every every week. Okay, so 
with every lab report there should or with every lab that we do there should be a lab report that goes with it. okay questions on the the lab report stuff so far any questions so far all right so let's look over here again a lot of this is reiterated here okay so when we are done with this lecture, the video you will find underneath lab one. So you'll find the video of this within each, each section. So I'll add an extra section in here for each one. As I said, I will be doing office hours during the week. I'll add an extra link in here for uh, my, my Zoom uh, office hours during the week. You're welcome to join for that. The um, let's see. If you haven't done the poll so far, please go ahead and do, do the survey, okay? Um, I'm trying to narrow down that if Saturday doesn't work for, for, for everyone, what day is a better day, okay? When can we do, when can we agree on a better meeting time? Uh, what I'll do is I'll leave it till, leave it open till tomorrow, right? And then basically from there, I will probably take a look at what are the two top choices and then try and narrow it down to a single better choice, okay? Um, right now it's looking like Wednesday morning is, is trending high on the, on the poll for people. So uh, that may mean that, you know, Wednesday, like 10 o'clock, yeah, there's nothing gonna be earlier than 10. I don't, I don't do anything other than coffee before 10 a.m. So, um, so it'll probably be around 10 o'clock if it's on a Wednesday morning, all right? So again, every video is going to have, every recording, every session is going to have a recording with it. So it's not a big deal. If you're not able to make it, we will, there will be a recording that goes with it. Okay. So you can always catch up on what you, on what you missed. All right. Questions on any of that so far? Sorry, quick question on the lab report. Sure. Um, I noticed on the example for the pre-lab section, the actual questions were included. I just wanted to double check that you would like us to include, like restate the question in the actual lab report. Yeah, I mean, you, you can. Again, the, it, if, you're, if you just copy and paste it, and then like some, sometimes it may be that you have to write, you have to handwrite the, the, pre, the pre-lab questions and then mm -hmm. scan everything, which okay. is fine, okay? Um, you just got to get it in there somehow. Okay. Right? So, um, the, like if the pre-lab questions have a lot of extenuous, you know, calculations, you know, like doing the, you know, the equilibrium calculations, sometimes those are a little tedious. So you got to kind of do it by hand. Okay. So you, so you may just want to PDF the whole, whole document at the end when you're done. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, do we need a title page? Mm, no, you just need the title put on there. But again, everything where you submit it, it should be associated with the report that it's supposed to be. So you just you just need a title on your report. Okay. And then uh, my second question is: if it gets changed, if the lab gets changed to Wednesday, mm -hmm. would the lab report be due on the next Wednesday by midnight? Mm, I, I may not change anything else. So I'm, when we do the meeting. I may keep like, I mean, the report would probably still be due. The you know, I'll, I'll probably I don't. Know. I, I probably won't change change the due dates for things. I'll probably keep the due dates on Saturdays. Okay. Right. Um, okay. But it just may be that our our next uh, meeting may be like earlier. So like, if if it's decided that Wednesday morning, we may do next like this Wednesday. For, for the next lab. And then that way, then we'll shift until until we're in we're in a better spot. And so then we'll just shift it to, to the Wednesdays from there on. So it may be that we have two meetings this week uh, to, to preempt everything. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Okay. Other questions? Uh, yeah, will you accept submissions of the lab report early so that you can review it and like tell us anything we missed or anything that we can prove before the final due date? Uh, I mean, you know, if it's if it's a big, you know, question of whether or not you're on target, you can email me the stuff. I mean, 
whatever you submit to Canvas, you should be prepared to get graded for that. So you know, I wouldn't submit anything on Canvas. I mean, I, yeah, I check the email every day. I can take a quick look at your, your lab reports and things and just check that you're on the right track if you email it to me. But uh, like I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be going with that as your, as your main way of doing it. Most of these should be relatively straightforward that you shouldn't need to, to really take a pulse on your lab reports all the time. Um, so, and like I said, one, if you're following the format and you you listen along with this, then you should most of them should probably be in good in good shape. So, but you, know, you can email me in advance if that's really a like a you know a big deal. Okay. okay. Thank you. But but definitely get something put on there. So I mean I understand you know as our you know schedules get busy, you know definitely give me something to grade. Like don't not submit anything. Okay, because definitely I mean the you know, getting partial credit for something is better than taking a zero on a, on a lab. So uh, definitely just try and get, get the stuff in as best you can. Okay. Other questions? And then we'll move on to real quick here to, to take a look at the, the hard water analysis. All right, so if you click on the hard water analysis link, okay, so it talks about what this lab is about. So again, we here we are analyzing two, uh, two water samples. So one of them is a standard calcium sample. Um, hold on one, one second. Sorry about that. Puppies over in the corner whining. I'm not sure how much of that was getting picked up. All right, so there is a PDF of the hard water analysis and there is data in here. So because this is a lab that we would normally have done in person, there, there is data now given to you. All right, so let's take a look at the, the handout here first. So here is your lab handout, right? So right off the bat, we can see that the objectives here are different than possibly the stated purpose, okay? The purpose of this experiment is to determine the calcium concentration of a water sample, which is identified as the third objective here, but the other ones are not really the purpose of doing the experiment. Okay, so we're not doing the experiment to learn about hardness of, of water. We're not doing the experiment, um, you know, to learn about volumetric analysis. Okay, so the purpose is to identify the concentration of calcium in a tap water sample and determine whether or not it is, you know, its hardness value. there is a procedure section, okay? So there's part A and part B. So part A was a standardization of ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid or EDTA. So that is our titrant that we're using, right? And then we're titrating that. So EDTA is a chelating agent. It is a binding agent. So it binds to, to metals. So in this case, it binds to calcium in the water and then it would change color. Okay, so we, so this is very similar to the lab you would have done in 111, where we did acid-base titrations in 111. Most everybody did, did something, unless you uh, were recently just did this in the spring, and at which point everybody was doing things virtually, and you didn't do an acid-base titration, but you did something similar to it. Our first one, we don't really know the concentration of the EDTA, so we have a standard calcium that we'll use to determine the EDTA in part A. And then in part B, we will use the new standardized EDTA to find the, the concentration of calcium in a tap water sample. 
Okay, so there are two parts of the experiment. All right, your it goes through the calculations, like the various kind of steps in the calculations that you would have to do. All right, so we can we'll go through this here uh, in just a minute, and then part B looks at how do we determine the the calcium comp PPM at the end. All right. So here's your, your procedure. Again, you can paraphrase this, you can bulletize it, summarize it. You just need to get this in your, in your lab handout or in your lab report, okay? Here are the pre-lab questions. Again, we already talked about those. You can handwrite them in if need be, okay? And then PDF the whole document, okay? Here's your data table, okay? Now, I'm giving you basically this same data table, okay? The things in here you would have to fill out, okay, that we would do in the lab, right, are the, the burette readings. That was really the focus of what you would do in the lab, is to do the titration and get the volumes off the burette. That's the, the experimental data that you would need. The rest of this is calculation, okay? For part B, the water sample, Okay, so this, so in part B, the focus is on the tap water sample. Your, the only data that really that you're collecting is the volume off the burette. How much did it take to reach the endpoint? Okay, the rest of this is calculation. Getting down to the parts per million of the calcium in the water. Okay, you don't need to do the post lab questions. Yeah, I highlighted that before, we don't need to do the post lab questions, but you'll have the data section to pull off here, okay? Questions on this one? Again, we'll look at the calculations here in a second as we look at what, what, da what data do you have? So let's look at the data that you've been given. Okay, now this should follow pretty much exactly along with the data table handout, okay, with the data table in the handout, okay. The concentration of the standard calcium, okay, so we are, we are starting from a 200 ppm calcium standard, okay. So in many labs, we have standards that we purchase, okay? So we know that this is 200 ppm, okay? So the question is then, what is the concentration of the EDTA, okay? So here you see the EDTA, okay? We don't know that part. So we have two parts of these labs. We have calcium and we have EDTA. In part A, we know the calcium and we're using that to find the EDTA. In part B, we know the EDTA and we're using that to find the calcium in another sample. So your first one is calculating the molarity of the, stand, of the calcium standard. So we're going from PPM to molarity, okay? Now this is a common calculation. Uh, you'll probably find this in your first chapter, okay? So your first chapter deals with uh, intermolecular forces. Mm, you, I don't, you, may not, you may not get to this to your second chapter maybe, okay? Because they introduce various uh, other kinds of units right, in the second chapter maybe. So, but we wanna know the moles of EDTA, okay? So this titration works the same as the acid-base titration. At the end point, the moles of the calcium equal the moles of the EDTA, all right? So here's your burette readings. So you would have done the titration, so we've got a volume, so you have four samples. Okay, we have four samples, so we have four volumes delivered, and so we can get four molarities of the EDTA, which you can then average and get a decent average value of the EDTA from part A. Okay, in part B then, okay, the average molarity of the EDTA is what you already have, okay? So you would have gotten that up here. 
we took four water samples at 25 milliliters each, and we titrated the, the water, okay? The calcium is, is what goes into the flask, so the calcium sample would go in the flask, the EDTA would have everything in the burette, okay? So here we have 25 milliliter water samples, and we titrated them against the EDTA, okay? Again, the amount the moles of EDTA dispensed at the endpoint would equal the moles of the calcium in the sample. Okay. So if we know the moles of the calcium in the sample, we know the volume of the sample, moles and volume equals molarity. And then we go from molarity to PPM. Okay, PPM is milligrams per liter. Okay. So, down here, then you can calculate the average PPM, the PPG or GPG, the uh, grams per gallon, you can calculate that too. Uh, and then, I want to know what is what is the what is the value of the water? Okay, what what is the concentration of things in the water? Okay. So, so you have all the data, okay? So it's just a matter of doing the calculations, all right? So let's, let's talk about the calculations here. Uh, you may have to find uh, the camera, so it's, so in the, guest view or in the the, uh, the you know people view so you may have to find sam 67 is the co-host now okay so you should be able to see my my piece of paper Right? Anybody can't, is anybody having a problem seeing the piece of paper and my, my blue pen? And you cannot see the piece of paper and the blue pen. No, you can see it. Okay. All right, so in part A, okay, we're starting off with a 200 ppm sample, okay, of calcium. Okay, 200 ppm is the same as saying 200 milligrams per liter. Okay, that is what a ppm is, is a milligram per liter. Okay, so we wanna convert this to molarity. Okay, well, there's a thousand milligrams in one gram. And since we're, since the basis of the calcium here is for calcium carbonate, there is 100.1 grams per mole. Okay, this is the molecular weight for calcium carbonate. Okay, so you would multiply all the numbers on the top, divide by all the numbers on the bottom, and this would give you a molarity. Right, so the milligrams go away, the grams go away, and the only units you're left with are moles per liter. Okay, so this tells me the molarity 
of the calcium in the sample. Okay, that was one of the first calculations in the data table. Okay. Now, when you're titrating it, okay, you have the moles of the calcium per liter, right? So this is the, the molarity. If we multiply this by the volume of our sample, okay, so the volume of the sample, remember you have to convert this to liters, okay? Don't forget, to, you gotta convert it to liters. This gives me the moles of the calcium. Okay, this is given to you already. Okay, this is given to you already. Okay. Um, is it possible to zoom in a little bit? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay, from the titration, the moles of the calcium equal the moles of the EDTA, okay? If you have the moles of the EDTA and we have the volume titrated, again, converted to liters, equals the molarity of the EDTA. Okay, so this number here is gonna be the same as this number here. Divided by the volume titrated, again, you have this value. It's just not in liters, right? So you gotta do some conversion before you do this. You have four samples, so you have four values of the EDTA. So you should end up with an average molarity of the EDTA for part A. Okay, that is the goal of part A. Questions on any of this so far? Okay, before we move on to part B. Okay. You'll notice if you if you pull up the, the data table, you'll notice these exact same things. 200 is the top number. The volume of the sample is given. The volume titrated is given. Okay. or the burette readings are given, so you can calculate the volume titrated. Okay, so there's nothing missing here that you don't have in the lab. You just have to do the calculations for the four samples. Again, you don't have to do it in Excel. You know, you, you're perfectly fine of like creating your own data table and handwriting the stuff in. You know, again, the, the key is, is getting the, getting the right calculations and making it look good. In the given data, um, there were four samples. In the lab, I think there's only three. Right, so yeah, you just, you add an extra column to your data table. Okay, so you want four. Yeah. Okay. And, I mean, usually, usually when we do experiments, we want to do as many samples as we can. We wanna have a, a good data set of, of things. Again, when we do this in the lab, we stop at three because you know you kind of do three and then everybody figures that that's, that's good enough that you got the point with three of them. Okay. But if we were in the lab, we might do you know four, five, six samples to drive a, a better data set. Okay, all right. So let's look at part B. Okay, so from part A, we already have the molarity of the EDTA, okay?
Okay, we already have this value. Okay, so from the molarity of the EDTA, okay, times the volume we titrate, right? Molarity times volume would give me the moles of EDTA. Okay, you have the volume titrated. That is a piece of data given to you. The moles of the EDTA equal the moles of the calcium in the water sample. So if we take the moles of the calcium in the water sample and divide it by the volume of the sample, again, in liters, you already have this value. Moles by liters is molarity. You have four samples, so we can have four molarities. Molarity is moles per liter, right? So this is the molarity value, okay? In one mole, there is 100.1 grams of calcium. This is the molecular weight for the calcium carbonate. In one gram, there is 1,000 milligrams. The only two units left here are milligrams per liter, which is a ppm. You have four samples. You can calculate the ppm of each sample and get an average. There are 17.1 ppms in one GPG. Okay, again, all of this is in the handout, right? All this is in the handout. Questions? You have the data, okay? You have all the data that you need. You have pre-lab questions. You have a procedure section. You just need to do the calculations for the four samples in part A, get a average molarity of the EDTA. You have four water samples, tap water samples for part B. You can get an average PPM and GPG of your water sample. You can then tell me what is in my water. How hard is my water? All right. And that concludes everything that you need to know for this lab. All right, so I will pause the recording here and we can talk about questions.